So I, I don't. I, I, I want to open it up entirely. I have just one question. I have a whole bunch of questions, but. Um, you want to see my DGA card? My Director's Guild card? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I actually, I have two questions. One is a technical question, and the other is, is not. I'll tell you both. First, is, the technical question is, how did you do the chicken in the, in the chicken suit and the crossing the road in the cart thing? Because I, I, was, I was concerned. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. And the non-technical question is, um, was that a happy ending? Um, all right, I'll go for the first one first. That's easier, <laughs> I think. Um, that was kind of the biggest production of the whole movie. It was pretty incredible. The, the, uh, there are all these meetings that took place. I was a part of some of them. <laughs> we showed up, and these guys had built, it basically was a, a, a truck with these two long things that came out that could control the, the uh, cart. And we pretty much drove it down the hill and let it fly. Um, you know, with a camera in there, and we actually, I actually used my own camera f for that, for, for fear of, I didn't want to wreck the, the red cameras are very expensive, so the actual thing, and we then tossed it up in the air, uh, and so forth, but there's, yeah, there's sort of a cut hidden, you know, when he gets in, there's a sort of a cut that gets hidden, then it turns just to, there's no people in there. In terms of production of my own stuff, the car that Arthur, that Dank was throwing rocks at was also my car. That's how, <laughs> that's how low budget this movie was. Um, and uh, I think it is meant to be a, a version of the happy ending, strangely. I think it's, I think, I mean, you know, again, if you like it better as a sad ending, then it's no. a sad ending. No, I, I think the idea is that somehow this this worked. His plan somehow worked. When that Pullman thing comes up, I think that's what it's yeah. meant to be. But at the same time, it's the greatest executive producer punchline in movie history. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm safe well, in saying. I'll tell you an interesting thing about that is it took uh, a, a tremendous amount of phone calls and waivers from the Directors Guild because there's all these union regulations of what credits can come up where. So I had to explain to them that that wasn't a real, he wasn't actually an executive producer. <laughs> he was a joke executive producer, which is why when the actual credits start, we had to then put we made this movie to sort of separate it and all of this. But it was, it was actually, there was a moment in time where I just thought, well, the whole punchline of our movie is not going to be <laughs> possible because of the DGA. But they, in the end, they, they let us do it. So. Well, I'm glad they did. So. Um, you have the director, co-writer, producer. Yes. I was just curious to know if any of the actors had been previously successful in anything. The, the only actors that had done anything really, uh, LeBron, uh, the main guy, he, he's, um, he actually, I think, was on like a Disney series when he was younger. I don't know which one it was. Um, and he had done some TV work. He had done some guest spots on shows. Michael Roman, who played Smitty, um, what, it, has been a child actor uh, and has been in a lot of commercials, but nothing, uh, nothing that you know, no, no, no real series work. In fact, we wanted to do the movie as a non-Screen Actors Guild movie, but once you get one SAG member, then the whole movie becomes SAG. And um, I believe only R.J. LeBron was a member of SAG. Um, he was the last one we cast, and all the other ones had to get their SAG cards to be in the movie. And I think they're quite good. I, I, Arthur, um, who played Dank, is now, has now since become a writer on the Jimmy Fallon show, and he appears occasionally doing sketches and stuff there. I think he's enormously talented, um, and Michael Roman, I think, is a huge talent also, Smitty, as is RJ. Sarah, I, really, a lot of them, I, I think, will ha have real careers, I, I hope. Yes, sir. I know we're in the law school, but could you share a little of the business um, economics of the film? You know, what does something like this cost to make, and what are you, how are you going to break even? And maybe talk a little bit about the possible revenue stream. Um, <clears throat> so this movie cost a million dollars in the end. Um, that's a little bit. Uh, uh, to be clear, it, it costs about a million three in production, but the state of Connecticut gives you a three hundred thousand dollar tax rebate because they so want uh, production. So if you, it's actually very scary. If you spend a million dollars, over a million dollars, they give you a thirty percent rebate, and under a million dollars, they give you a fifteen percent rebate. And literally, 
when you're like 980, you're like, all right, let's go. Because <laughs> they come in and audit. And for example, the, 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 the day with Pullman was shot in New York, so that doesn't count for them. So you have to make sure you get over, because it's not graded. It's literally like the next dollar, everything becomes 30%. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much what the movie cost, a million dollars out of pocket. Um, and you know, revenue, uh, right now we're on iTunes. Um, and a lot of other VOD formats, uh, Amazon, I don't know, Google Play, all, all is that a place? I don't know, all, all, many other things. And then I think it moves to uh, Hulu at some point and sort of more prescription, prescription, subscription, prescription, depending on <laughs> 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 subscription uh, stuff there. And then, you know, who, who knows? Maybe, maybe uh, television at some point down the road. I, it's really a work in progress. Um, you know, how we make our money back on this. But the good thing is that it's a, it's a relatively small investment as movie go, goes. And again, we spent nothing on marketing. There's no, this is, <laughs> this is the marketing plan right here. <laughs> so. So move this movie. Yes. You know? <laughs> it's all up to you. Actually, I think that's why those people left. They went to start tweeting about it. So I'm, I'm fine. No, we didn't. We, you know what? We, we submitted uh, a very early cut of the movie to Sundance. And I don't know how much you know about Sundance, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to get a movie in there, especially a movie. A comedy is really hard, and a movie like this is particularly hard. Um, so I never thought we had much of a chance. And this is something I would do over again, actually, I think if I had to do it again. So we submitted a really rough early cut of the movie. We were kind of told, oh, that's OK. They, you know, and the movie's changed quite a bit since then. And amazingly, when we submitted to Sundance, I kind of just wrote it off. Um, my agency is CAA, Creative Artists Agency, and they have, they represent, I think they represent Sundance, and they know all, you know, everybody there. And suddenly, we, I got a call that it looked like we were going to get into Sundance. And I just thought this was amazing to me. There's three people there, um, and the two of the guys love the movie, the two young guys. But then there's one guy who's the real guy, John Cooper. <laughs> And I think he was just like, have you lost your mind? We're not putting this in our festival. So we, so we ended up not getting in there. And that's right around when we decided to go, kind of go this other way with Snag and so forth. Um, and really, festivals are fantastic. The real reason to be in a festival ultimately is to get theatrical distribution. And you can be really successful at festivals. I'm not poo-pooing them. Like my next movie, I for sure would put in a festival if I can get in. Um, but that's really not after what you said about Cooper. You're not <laughs> getting in. Oh, I, th I thought he made the right call. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're watching this. Um, but anyway, so that that was our little history with festivals. We kind of went another direction. So we thought even if we got into a festival, ultimately, what it would end up being in the best case would be a small theatrical release. And by then, we kind of had decided, oh, let's try this differently. So here we are. Everything. <laughs> Do it all. Or just buy 100,000 copies of the movie yourself. I'm, that's, I'm fine with that, too. Well, if, if you are interested in learning more, there is a website, successwemadeofmovie.com. And it tells you how to get access to the movie. It tells you how to get access to the soundtrack. Um, if you guys want to pick up some free soundtracks before you leave, please do. Um, and uh, we're also on Facebook. And um, you know, certainly, you can, reach, you can reach any of us. I mean, we read face, the Facebook page every day. So if you have questions, you want help with anything, we'll answer you. Right, so so uh, just for the, uh, for the webcast, mm -hmm. um, you're saying that people can reach Rob and you through Facebook and uh, we made this movie.com. That's pretty easy to remember. That is pretty easy to remember. Facebook, if you message us on Facebook, we'll get back to you. OK, there's a, a promise you may be sorry you made. <laughs> I, I have read every single message, I swear. <laughs> yes. Is there going to be a DVD and other DVD extras? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny is the DVD extras of this movie were shot by my daughters, Sydney and Lucy. Um, and most of the ba all the behind the screen, uh, behind the scenes footage from that press reel was shot by them. So there literally was a point when I'm looking <laughs> up and I see the freshman actors like this, and then behind them I see my daughters like this, <laughs> and my head was going to just explode. Would <laughs> uh, there be a DVD? Yeah, there might be. Actually, I think that it's possible. 
uh, we're trying to push to get an early release for Christmas. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Ready. <laughs> and then um, the beginning of the year. You actually have this in front of you. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, um, ooh, there we go. Um, yes, so um, we'll put information up on the website on Facebook when, it, when it's available, but we hope to get an early version out or at least the pre-orders for Christmas. And then the beginning of the year, it should be generally available. I'll tell you one little, little behind the scenes uh, story from this movie that is, is touching. Um, it's apropos of nothing, but I just thought of it. Um, so Michael Roman, who played Smitty, originally auditioned for the part of LeBron. And uh, we loved him. He was hilarious in the audition. He really cracked us up. But we didn't think he was quite right for the lead. He kind of had a sort of sarcastic, snarky attitude. And he, he left. And uh, John Beckerman and I said, oh, you know what? He would be great for Smitty. He is Smitty. He's perfect for that. So we called him up. And amazingly, he lives uh, in Albany. And Buckstown is fictionally set in upstate New York. So that was already a little weird. And we called him up and we said, I'm sorry, you didn't get the part for LeBron, but we'd like you to be Smitty. And, he, uh, and, and we explained to him what the part is. And you know, he's kind of this sarcastic guy. But you know, then you find out that he, you know, he's taking care of his sick mother. And there's just silence on the other end of the phone. And I think, is it possible that this kid who's never really acted in anything is turning down the non-lead part for the movie? That can't be. And finally, he kind of comes out and says, I, I'm sorry. I'm thrilled. Thank you so much. But it's a little strange because I uh, have just, I, I just returned home to take care of my sick mother uh, who passed away, um, I think, three or four months before the movie started. And they were very close. Um, she was with him on all of his auditions when they were a kid. They would go to New York City. So it was this crazy parallel story. So one of the strange things, I think, in, in the marketing of this movie and in the making of this movie is you know, there's very disparate tones. You, know, you, you have chicken with a boner, and then you've got you know, a, a funeral scene. And sometimes you, know, you were shooting that stuff on the same day. And, and you, you really just thought, as you were doing it, this will, this, we may be making the worst movie ever because you're like, how can you shoot this and that and put it in the same movie? And we thought, well, if there's a way to make this work, it, it might be a nice little movie. During the funeral scene, uh, Michael, uh, the, the little piece of paper that he reads from his speech was actually the letter, the last letter that his mother, his actual mother, wrote to him. So it was extremely touching for us uh, shooting this. It was really emotional to sort of see him kind of get through this. Um, and one of my favorite extras in the movie, uh, my wife right over there, um, now to put it in perspective, she more or less can cry at anything. She's probably going to cry now. It's possible. Um, I'm tearing up. She's tearing up. But I said to her before we shot, I said, you know, if you could squeak out a tear, that would be, be kind of good. Well, my, she knew, you know, we all became great friends with these actors. They, in order to, they lived with me for, they lived with us for a, a week before the movie started. We wanted them all to be friends, so we had them all move into our house, and we became very close with them, and they're still, you know, very good friends of ours. So when Michael started doing this, it was really tough for all of us, and I look over, and poor Eunice literally was crying to the point of dehydration in the, in the shooting of the movie. And at one point, we then were done with the, shooting this way, and now we're shooting this way. And I look over, she's not on camera anymore, and she's just still bawling for, for like an hour. I said, honey, you can stop crying. And she said, no, I can't. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it, was, it was really, uh, it, it was a very touching uh, part of it. I thought Michael did a, he did an amazing job with that, I thought, all things considered. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, uh, Steve Garfield? Uh, hi, Steve yeah. Garfield. I'm a video blogger. He's a pioneering video blogger, I might say. Some people say I invented video blogging January 1st, 2004. That person would be you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. I'm not messing with you. Go ahead. You're scary to me. So um, I'm going to write a blog post about this and you know, help promote it. So I was wondering if I could do a quick video right now with you, like 30 seconds. Let's go. But, but only if we can get three people videoing you, videoing them, videoing them. That's what I normally do. So, so what I'll do is I'll introduce it, then I'll come up, ask you to say something quick, and then I'll ask you all what you thought of the movie. 
and then we'll have a big round of applause, and that's how we'll end it, okay? I love it. Everybody's good with that. All right. Can everyone just say they like the movie? The guy invented video blogging. Don't, don't always be here. Okay, here we go. Hey everybody, it's Steve Garfield from stevegarfield.com and we're here at Harvard and we just saw a uh, movie, it's called We Made This Movie and we happen to have one of the producers of the movie, Rob Burnett here. And if you could uh, tell us about the movie real quick, that'd be great. Well, interestingly, we actually shot the movie on an iPhone. So this is very, <laughs> very comfortable with this. Uh, the movie is available on iTunes, it's We Made This Movie um, and I think, well, you know what, ask the group, they saw it. They... <laughs> I'll tell you something, this performance right here, they're all in my next movie. They're good liars. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Wow. <laughs> thank you so much. Right. Appreciate that. We get huge well, yeah. we'll see. I'll check the iTunes sales. <laughs> we'll see how big that following is next week. Oh, the web makes everything odd. <laughs> True. <laughs> we don't have to have a rating, actually. Do we have a, I mean, it's a, we call it, we say it's a rated R, just for, yeah. and for language, but I don't know, like the MPAA. It's not rated, should I use this? Sure. Yeah, it's not, it's not rated. It doesn't turn on, okay. It's not rated on iTunes, but interestingly enough, when Snag Films puts up clips, if there's if there's any language in it, then they have to put an age qualifier. What does a chicken boner qualify as? <laughs> that PG-13 or R? I'm not no, sure. No age requirement. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing I learned about this movie. If you're ever shooting with chickens, you need a lot more chickens than you think. That's all I can tell. <laughs> in the script, it's you know a sea of yellow chickens go <laughs> pouring out of the. And, and I remember having this production meeting, and so, it's so rare in life when there's just a right and a wrong, and even rarer when I'm right. And we have the production meeting, and they say, we're going to get 100 chickens. And I go, I don't know chickens, but that just, it doesn't feel like enough chickens to me, 100 chickens. I think we need more chickens. Like, well, they're expensive. We can't. So I get talking to 100 chickens, and I'll never forget. We show up there, and I am telling you, a hundred chickens can fit on a quarter. They like they just they bunch up, and I'm like, "Where's the scene? <laughs> chickens? What are we gonna do?" It's always horrible. But but no chickens were hurt in the making of the movie. <laughs> and my 16 year old daughter now doesn't eat chicken, so they save chickens making the movie on top of it. So that's good. Scott, um, I, I think YouTube has become a a a, a, tool, a huge tool for for. Stand-ups, you know, now they they can send their set, you know, that they did on the road. Everyone, it used to be a big deal for people to put together a reel, you know, to make a promotional reel. And now everyone does it, and they put it up on YouTube. Um, I think SNL um, cast someone off of YouTube. I could be wrong about that, but I, I think they actually got a cast member from from a guy that was just doing impressions off of YouTube. So um, we don't. We're not really cast at the Late Show. We're mostly looking for writers, so you know we're not. We don't really cast actors. We don't really have a need for actors. So that process is is pretty similar. You know, it was always you know send us. So it's email now instead of a, a letter, but it's that's pretty similar. But um, we definitely uh, in casting the movie before we settled on these actors, we looked or, or we poked around YouTube a lot and I, I do think I think there are people that are gaining prominence on YouTube that get real looks from people. I think there's lots of examples of it that exist that I in television now I think there are people that that came up through YouTube. I think it's happening for sure. Another question or two perhaps? Well speaking of YouTube, you know, they're they're putting money into becoming their own channel. Mm -hmm. or a distribution center. How does that influence the market in general? Or you know, I guess, I guess it ultimately depends on, you know, on how successful they are. You know, I mean, in my television world, what's happened is a very uh, nice pie that was cut in large pieces 
has been not only cut into smaller pieces, but more or less put through a blender and is now being served in tiny little paper cups. So the, the, these, this is a whole other, you know, <laughs> you thought that, remember the good old days in 2008 when you had this, in 2012 <laughs> when you had this much? Now, now it could be even less. And, you know, ultimately, in, and I don't know anything about this stuff, but I ultimately feel like where all of this heads, and I, I know more about television than I do movies, but movies included, ultimately, it's got to all settle into some version of you have to pay for content somehow. You know what I mean? And somehow it's going to be everything will be on demand. You know what I mean? So these YouTube channels, I guess my ultimate feeling is, as an aggregator of content, that is where they will rise or fall. Meaning, if they have a show as good as Breaking Bad on their YouTube channel, then that'll be great. And if they don't, then it won't. Because I, what I think is wearing off, frankly, is the novelty of all of this. You know, it used to be like, oh my god, look what that 16-year-old kid made. Well, now it's like, great, but I only want to watch if it's better than what some guy that is a professional can make. Sometimes it can be, and if it is, great. You know what I mean? And I think the distribution will ultimately somehow sort itself out in ways that I don't understand. You, you talked earlier about um, the transition of film actors into television. I think we're seeing them as, as a whole doing something on the YouTube channels at this point. We're seeing Funny or Die and others pop up in, and, and creating their own content and, and pulling in stars to do it. Changes the whole game. Yeah, well, I mean, I think celebrities have never been more, oh god, kill me for saying this. Celebrities have never been more valuable than they are right now. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it, so much of things is, is branding and getting recognition. I mean, Funny or Die, is largely, I think, where it is because of celebrities participating in it. It's a great concept, right? Oh, we put up videos and people vote on them and the funny ones. That, but without the giant celebrities drawing you to those things, I don't think that exists. Yeah, when you've got like, uh, Rob Codry with his uh, possible show that started on the web, right. now being broadcast on, on television. Right, exactly. And, and again, if you think of um, Adult Swim, you're talking about Children's Hospital? Yes. Yeah. So if you talk about Adult Swim, there, you, what you have, in my opinion, all of this now comes down to curation, right? And what Adult Swim has done has managed to narrow cast a very specific, to a very specific audience, which I am one of. <laughs> I know what I get when I go to Adult Swim, and I like many of the things there. Some of the things are too comedically hip even for me. Um, I, I should be younger, but what's that? Hard to imagine. Well, have you seen Robot Chicken? Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I actually love Robot Chicken. Um, but you know what I mean? And I think ultimately that will be the task of YouTube channels and everything else. You know what I mean? Is, oh, here's the YouTube channel for this thing, and you know what you're going to get. And if you can start going to places the way you used to go, to say HBO, or the way you used to go to MTV for music videos, you know what I mean? These places are all struggling for, for identity, and I think the net will have the same struggles as network television, as cable, as all, every distribution outlet. So, so the, I'm sorry, you said the broadcast piece got, that got drawn away by cable and their uh, subject matter, you know, becoming subject matter experts by channel, going even further to your point, the blending uh, on the net. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I, I, I want to raise a possibility, and I have no idea if this will actually pan out, but there seems to me to be continuing, in fact, increasing, say, steam. So there's an old metaphor. Increasing steam behind uh, do-it-yourself um, entertainment um, meme culture. That a lot of the net um, outside of Funny or Die and uh, are um, us entertaining ourselves and frequently doing so in a way that is purposefully hand-drawn and amateur. Um, XKCD, which is arguably, you know, Doonesbury for the internet generation. It's certainly that quality. It's stick figures, and it's stick figures, I think, sort of on purpose um, because it's um, sort of a thumb in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, the, the use of meme, you know, photographs with the same, uh, same photograph, different punchlines, that seems to be actually increasing and it's in the election, the campaign. That stuff seemed to be increasing in importance. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, 
is a reaction against a professional, um, a professional culture, but it, it may have its own life. So I, I don't know. You would think that it would die, that it would go away. Um, I think a version but of it I'm has sure that it will. Well, there's, there's something interesting to me about this. It has a version of its own life, and it depends what it is. And I, I, one area that is particularly fascinating to me is what is, so I work at The Late Show. We have a writing staff of you know, 10 very good comedy writers who are churning out material every day. How do they compare with the 300 million <laughs> comedy writers out in the country that can, can write stuff? You know, any one of them, I don't think, would survive in our writing room. But as a giant group, if curated possible, it's pretty tough. It's fine. You know, I had this experience just, just a, a, a little while, a week ago, right, the day before the election, I tweeted this stupid little thing. Um, I'm not citing this because this is a good joke. This it was late at night, and I just, I just, I tweeted this, and I, and it was something like, if I owned a diner um, tomorrow. I would serve Obamlets and a, another diner food that has a clever play on the word Romney. <laughs> the joke being that I'm kind of too lazy to finish my own joke, right? But the, the, the result of this was that then people started tweeting me um, Rom Neroni and <laughs> right. you know, hundreds of yeah. these things. And it really stuck with me because honestly, you know, we do these top 10 lists at The Late Show, and I talked about this up at work. It's not unusual for us to, we could have done this as a topic, you know, as a silly topic, uh, you know, f you know if, if Mitt Romney owned a diner or if, you know, some version of that. And, and if I'm honest about it, that mass of, of tweets that I got was pretty much what our list would have been. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But, it, so I, that's, it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's, there, there are certain short things that the internet is really meant for, I think, where, you know, it's, it's kind of like even when, even before the internet, where, you know, you're, there's some big hot story and then some joke emerges from Wall Street that's like hilarious, you know? I don't like the Wall Street people either, don't worry, we're in this together. <laughs> but occasionally they can come up with a funny joke. Um, Lehman Brothers, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, but then, you know what I mean? So, so it is this strange, thing from a from a, an artistic standpoint you're like well what is it almost starts to approach the old you know if, if there's a thousand monkeys banging typewriter will they create shakespeare in a way it's like what relationship does an auteur or someone that considers themselves a professional that does this consistently does that mean anything versus the giant group that if they all kind of do it right. together but I don't think a, a group like that could ever make a movie, really. I think that they can. Sounds like a challenge to me. No, no, no. <laughs> Stay away. Stay back. Just write funny captions. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, for sure. Uh, one last question, then we will wrap up. First of all, I really oh. enjoyed the film. Thank you. Uh, I'm in the process of working on my first documentary for the Harvard Law School documentary studio. And I really appreciated the way you captured Thank you. I love the connection when Smitty cried, uh, the, the first kiss. Like I felt the highs and the lows. Is there any advice that you have uh, for someone who wants to capture the humanity? Even though I'm doing a documentary, I felt like your film had a sort of documentary feel to it. What would you, I guess, recommend if someone who wants to capture the humanity, make the connection with the well, yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with documentaries, and you may be able to speak better to that. But I, in, in general, um, and everyone has their own sort of sensibility, but for my sensibility and, and my writing partner, John Beckerman's sensibility, is everything is driven by reality. And, and once you, things can get very extreme and things can get very silly, but, but once you veer from reality in a way, I think that snaps something with you in the audience. Like once, you know, for a certain kind of movie, I mean, if you're watching a Marx Brothers movie or, you know, you're watching The Hangover, then reality is not so important. You're just there to laugh and it all exists on a certain level, but I don't think those movies would satisfy what you're looking for. I think, to me, what's important is always keeping things as close to reality as possible and constantly asking yourself questions of would someone actually do this, you know what I mean, and not, and I think this could probably apply to documentaries as well, is that when you're creating a narrative, be it in, in fiction or, or documentaries, 
you, I think, probably at some times have an urge to kind of push your story in a certain way. Um, and I think you have to do that very artfully. And I think if you do that too forcefully, you're telling your story in a way that doesn't feel real. I think that's when the audience breaks from you. And they will, no matter what you do, they will not feel what you want them to feel. That, that's just my own theory on it. You know what I mean? And, and I think the more, the other part of that, I think, is the more the more details you can, you can have. I mean, that's really what people respond to is, I think, specifics rather than generalizations. Um, let's ask the same question. Of, of the yeah, let's get a mind. real answer. Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what you're working on, what the material is. If it's, if it's a promotional piece, it's harder to get that humanity in reality because a lot of it is set up. But I, I mean, just from the work I'm inspired by, the the work that is real and has the elements that you know really pull at your heartstrings is the stuff that sort of happens when you think the camera should stop rolling. Um, so it's those it's those scenes where you're watching things play out, and then someone says something and it's awkward, but you hold that shot because they give the camera a look or you a look, and then they say that something else that really makes that scene. And so I think that as a document documentary filmmaker. The biggest thing that I use to my advantage is awkwardness. So that, that horrible feeling where someone's like, why do you still have the camera on me? But they do something that, that is very, tell it, it tells you a lot about their personality. So that's the only thing I can say. I told you her answer would be better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and if people want to know more about Hollow, what's the URL? Uh, it's just hollowthefilm.com. Yep. But when we launch, it'll be projecthollow.org. So it's Hollow the Films, the temporary site. So, so uh, unfortunately, we need to bring it to a close. But if, if you want to uh, contact uh, Rob or Jeannie, um, come up business cards or other ways of uh, other you know, ways that they can get in touch with you, would be very welcome. So uh, thank, thank you all. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. So much. Thank you. By the way, we also want to really thank the Berkman Center. You guys were amazing. Thank you so much. It's totally our pleasure. Honor and